Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 13 of Ben Franklin's World the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. For more than a decade, American news outlets have reported on the issue of same-sex marriages and whether or not they should be legal. With all of this reporting, it is no wonder that we tend to think of gay marriage as a 21st century issue. But did you know that the American history of same-sex marriage predates our present time by over 200 years? In today's episode, Rachel Hope Cleves, an associate professor of history at the University of Victoria in British Columbia and author of Charity and Sylvia, A Same-Sex Marriage in Early America, will introduce us to the story of Charity Bryant and Sylvia Drake, two women who lived in an open, same-sex relationship that their friends, families, and neighbors described as a marriage. During our conversation, Rachel will reveal who Charity Bryant and Sylvia Drake were and whether their relationship was unique, why William Cullen Bryant and other friends and family members described Charity and Sylvia's relationship as a marriage, and more information about early American views on sex, marriage, and single, unmarried women. Now, just a note here, although this episode talks about early American views on sex, sexuality, and marriage, it does not discuss any of the topics in graphic or anatomical detail. It offers a clean discussion of early American domestic life. But before we get to our conversation with Rachel, I have something I'd like to share with you. A modern-day discovery. After studying all the best available news, foreign and domestic, Liz has a modern-day discovery to share with you. As you may know, I am revising my dissertation into a book, which I am tentatively calling America's First Gateway. The book will present a cultural history of the United States by looking at the community of Albany, New York, between 1614 and 1830. Now, just this morning, I had a realization. I'm revising what will be Chapter 4 of America's First Gateway, And this chapter tells the story of Albany right after the French and Indian War, but before the American War for Independence begins, so roughly between 1763 and 1775. During the French and Indian War, the British Army made Albany its northern headquarters and staging areas for its campaigns against Canada and against French and Native American incursions into northern and western New York. Now, the British Army needed thousands of soldiers for its campaigns, and its commanding officers decided that it needed to keep somewhere in the range of 1,000 to 1,500 soldiers in the area during winter, a time when armies of the 18th century did not typically attack one another. As a community of not more than 2,500 people, housing near 1,000 soldiers in the city proved to be a great challenge. As Albany did not have enough barrack space for these soldiers, commanding officers ordered the Albanians to provide them with house space in their private homes. James Campbell, the Earl of Loudoun, even conducted an inventory of the people and their houses in order to determine exactly how many men the city could hold in its private homes. Now, needless to say, the people of Albany were anxious to have the British Army leave their community after the war. But the army did not show immediate signs of leaving, so many of the inhabitants began to protest. Between 1763 and 1767, the people of Albany participated in eight riots, or what the records term as mob actions, against the British Army's buildings and its soldiers. This backstory brings me to my modern-day discovery. These eight riots clearly show the transition from nonviolent protests against property to violent, directed protests against people. In 1763, the Albanians attacked the army's buildings, which offended them not only because they belonged to the army, but because the army had built them on prime city-owned lands. Albany experienced a population boom after the French and Indian War, and the citizens of the city wanted and needed their land back to accommodate their increasing population. However, by 1764, 
the riots became more personal and violent. Two riots in 1764 took place when citizens of Albany accosted British soldiers. In the first instance, two drunken officers harassed a local woman, which made her male neighbors really angry. And the situation turned into a violent street brawl between British soldiers garrisoned in the city and the men of Albany. So you can just picture that in your mind. It was an all-out melee. The second incident involved two men of Albany who attacked a British sentry who had supposedly verbally abused one of them. These riots occurred interspersed with the actions against the army's property. But the transition from nonviolent actions against property to violent directed attacks against people continued. In January 1766, the Albany Sons of Liberty attacked Henry Van Skak, a man who they suspected had applied for the position of stamp collector in Albany. Now, Van Skak confronted the Sons of Liberty and he denied their claims, but he refused to swear their oath that he would never apply for the position in the future. Van Skak said he refused to swear the oath on principle. He questioned why he should swear off such a lucrative government position when none of the other men in the community would be made to do so. Now, the Sons of Liberty did not like his response. They marched to Van Skak's house, and they trashed it. They broke his windows, drank his fine wines, destroyed his furniture, and then they lit his carriage on fire and dragged it through the streets of Albany. Fearing for his life, Van Skak relented and took the oath. I mean, who can blame him, right? Sons of Liberty at his tail. The nature and transition of protests and riots changed as the imperial crisis escalated and the American Revolution turned into the war for independence. In fact, the personal nature of 18th century warfare depicts just how violent protests had become during the mid-1770s and early 1780s. So there you have it. There's our modern-day discovery. Okay, let's delve into the story of Charity Bryant and Sylvia Drake with Rachel Hope Cleaves. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Today we welcome Rachel Hope Cleves, who is an associate professor of history at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. She is the author of two books, The Reign of Terror in America, Visions of Violence from Anti-Jacobinism to Anti-Slavery, and most recently, Charity and Sylvia, A Same-Sex Marriage in Early America. Rachel's love for early American history developed as she traveled across the United States. She has visited every U.S. state except for Alaska and maybe Missouri. Rachel tweets at Rachel Cleves and maintains a research blog at rachelhopecleves.com. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. So before we dive into our discussion of Charity and Sylvia, I think we need to know, have you visited Missouri I think I still have not, which is funny considering how much time I spend talking about it in class. I teach uh, the U.S. History Survey and I teach an antebellum course. And of course, I talk about the Missouri Compromise and I talk about um, Missouri as a gateway to the West. And I, I talk about Missouri as a border state. I've taught the book Celia a Slave. I, uh, and especially this year with, um, you know, the events going on in Ferguson, I've been drawing connections between, you know, the past and the present. So I've talked about Missouri probably more than most states this year in my, in my teaching, but I still have never been there. So I'm hoping that somebody at some point will invite me, especially because I hear the barbecue is great and I like to eat. So yeah, or, or maybe a conference or maybe you can plan your next vacation there. There was a meeting of SHEER, the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic in uh, St. Louis, not that long ago, but there, I couldn't make it. So Bummer. Next time. The time <laughs> will come. So Charity Bryant and Sylvia Drake lived as husband and wife in Weybridge, Vermont, between 1807 and Charity's death in 1851. Rachel Hope's book, Charity and Sylvia, investigates their marriage and asks, did these women share a sexual relationship? But it also uses the relationship to provide an account of early American views on marriage, family, health, work, and religion. So, Rachel, let's start at the beginning. How did you discover the relationship of Charity and Sylvia? And who were these women, and was their same-sex relationship unique in early America? Well, the story of how I discovered them is 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 kind of funny. It's 
um, a story I like to describe it as a story of kismet. Uh, it actually begins 10 years ago. So I was working on this project for a long time. I was uh, on a camping vacation in Vermont in the summer of 2004, and I was staying at a campsite near the town of Middlebury, and I went into Middlebury for the day just to check it out because I'd never been. And I went into the local history museum and I was at that point finishing up my dissertation in U.S. history. And of course, I was a big history nerd. Um, so I would go into the <laughs> history museum on my vacation. Anyway, I was in there and and I commented to my partner who I was with, you know, it's places like this that just have who knows what amazing treasures in the archives I saw that they they had a, a historical archive. You know, wh- what could be on those shelves? Anyway, fast forward about six months, I was back home and I was finishing my dissertation and I was working on the last chapter in which I described how uh, the generation of abolitionists who came of age in the 1830s had been raised in this culture of anti-Jacobinism or the, their parents had been... Um, and I talked about the transmission between anti-Jacobinism and anti-slavery. And I was reading the uh, biography of William Cullen Bryant, who was this very famous antebellum newspaper editor, anti-slavery editor, and also poet, of course. And I came across this letter he wrote that described paying a visit to his two aunts in Vermont in the summer of uh, one summer in the 1830s. Um, actually, sorry, 1840s. And he described the relationship between them as being like a marriage. And I had just never come across any description of a same-sex relationship during the early American Republic or the antebellum era that was so explicitly described as being a marriage, right? Not just a, a romance or a union, but so specifically as a marriage. And Brian uses the words husband and wife and describes it as a marriage. And and in fact, models the description after the marriage ceremony in the Book of Common Prayer. So I was intrigued, and I went to see if I could find out if there were any sources about uh, the women. And I looked online, and lo and behold, I discovered that there is, in fact, a big repository of their papers at this local history museum, the Henry Sheldon in Middlebury, Vermont. And on top of that, as if that wasn't coincidence enough... I discovered that there is a second repository of their sources, this one uh, at a regional history archive housed at Northern Illinois University, where I had just the week before accepted my first job. (laughs) So I felt like the strings were being pulled, and it was a project that I absolutely had to do. And then I kind of two-timed my dissertation for the next four or five years until I got it out as a book, and then got to work full-time on Charity and Sylvia. Boy, that is a story of kismet. Yes, it was a kismet story. So who were they, you asked? Um, So Charity and Sylvia were two ordinary women who lived in in an extraordinary same-sex marriage in the first half of the 19th century. Both of the women were born during the Revolutionary Era. Charity Bryant was born at the beginning of the war in 1777, and Sylvia Drake was born right after the end of the war in 1784. They were both uh, born in Massachusetts, actually in neighboring towns in North Bridgewater and in Easton, which are south of Boston. And um, they uh, they grew up um, in these towns uh, south of Boston. Sylvia's family was bankrupted by the Revolution, and so she moved with her siblings north to western Vermont during her mid-teens. Charity remained living in Massachusetts until her late 20s, working as a teacher and a seamstress. And then in 1807, she went to pay a visit to Vermont, uh, to this town where Sylvia had moved. And she met Sylvia while she was there and decided to stay there with Sylvia, renting a house. Uh, The two women moved in together in July of 1807, and they lived together for the rest of Charity's life working as tailors to support themselves and taking part in the community. And when Sylvia died in 1868, she was buried under the same headstone as Charity. Wow, that's remarkable. Yeah, it's a it's a remarkable story. But you, you asked if their relationship was unique, and I think that the answer to that question is no. Um, 
We do have traces of evidence about other same-sex couples who live together in early America. What's unusual about Charity and Sylvia is the amount of sources that remain uh, that can t- teach us about their lives. So Charity in particular was a, a, a poet and, and wrote many poems which she left behind. Sylvia left behind years of her daily diary. And both women maintained a large correspondence, and we have thousands of letters that they received as well as a handful of letters that they wrote. And we also have um, business books uh, that they kept and you know, other ephemera that they held on to throughout their lives. So that's quite unique. But I think there are other same-sex couples. I know that there were other same-sex couples who lived together in early America, and there are traces of them in the archives. And I suspect, you know, treasures in local historical societies that remain to be uncovered. And um, and I hope there's people out there right now working on finding these stories. And some of that, I think, might require uh uh, a little bit of reading between the lines. Some of these relationships, I think, are hidden in plain sight. Some of the women couples are referred to as two maiden ladies, you know, and so, <laughs> or even as sisters or as cousins. So I think it might require some creativity on the part of historians to um, see the romantic relationships that are uh, encapsulated by those descriptors. But I think that they're out there. Now, these women weren't actually legally married. They just lived together as, as husband and wife. So to better understand that, you know, were they legally married? I mean, how did early Americans view the institution of marriage? And when did men and women typically marry in early America? Well, that question of whether they were legally married is is a really interesting question, I actually think, and not quite so black and white as it might appear to us now in the early 21st century. But to start with your last question, what was marriage typically like in early America? I actually don't think there's a single answer to that question. Uh, It varied so much by region, by uh, class, by status and race, by religion, um, and by era, right? So marriage has always been an extremely diverse institution, and I think that that is the main lesson that there is to be taken from the history of marriage that um, it has been done and is, is being done now. So specifically, what was marriage like for women of Charity and Sylvia's type, by which I mean uh, middle-class, free, white New England women at the late you know, tail end of the 18th century. Um, that's an interesting question because marriage was really in a state of flux. The The answer to that is that w- women like them, their sisters, typically married in their early 20s, um, and uh, men might marry a little bit later. Sometimes women might marry in their late teens, like Charity's older sisters did, because they were just desperate to get out of their house, I think. Sometimes women might marry in their late 20s, like Sylvia's sisters did, because they didn't have the resources uh, to get married at a younger age, because the family had been bankrupted. One thing that um, we can say is that almost all free white women in New England in the 18th century eventually married. What changed in the early 19th century was that an increasing number of women in that class began to choose to live out their lives unmarried, and it represents really quite a massive demographic transition. Now, you also asked you know, what sort of institution was marriage in the late 18th century or the early 19th century? And I think that the answer to that question is also somewhat surprising. The way in which we see the history of marriage deployed these days in the debate over the legalization of same-sex marriage, people often argue that in the past, marriage was, by definition, a reproductive institution, right? And that this is a reason why uh, same-sex marriage could or should be legally denied to same-sex couples today. And I disagree with that interpretation of what lay at the core of uh, the institution of marriage in early America. Although, in fact, most marriages were reproductive, when you read um, the marriage ceremony, for example, in the Book of Common Prayer, uh, what you find is that the, the 
the primary purpose of marriage was to contain um, uh, people's sexual lusts, right? To provide a a legal or an acceptable um, context in which people could um, could have sex fundamentally, and that's why. You see older couples, you pass the age of reproduction, right? Widows who are postmenopausal, uh, marrying, you know, widowers. Uh, people got married into their, you know, 70s, 80s, even 90s. Sometimes newspapers from early America would carry kind of funny stories of, of you know, old people who had met in, um, you know, as, as paupers marrying in their in the early 90s. And obviously those marriages were not fundamentally structured around uh, reproduction. Rather, they were structured around, um, and although we might be uncomfortable in our kind of youth-driven culture today, but they were structured around self-sexual bonds. So, um, so marriage was absolutely kind of a sexual institution at its core. It was also a productive bond. A lot of uh, Sylvia's sister's marriages seem to be based around, you know, you know creating a unit of production. Um, so uh, a husband and wife joining together uh, and working together to, to create resources to feed themselves and uh, their children. But romance also did play a role in marriage, um, and it's not just an invention of the modern age. And you can find wonderful letters or poems between spouses, even in 17th century America, that speak of um, the you know depth of love that spouses could have for each other. So marriage was a diverse institution, in other words. That's a very different view than most people have of the descendants of Puritans. You know, they tend to think of them as prudes and why talk about sex? You know, you should be talking about God. But it seems that they were very much concerned with sex and whether or not they were satisfied with it. Absolutely. And we have examples from the 17th and 18th century of people pursuing divorces, for example, um, or legalized separations when one spouse refused or was unable to um, sexually uh, consummate the relationship, and not only for reasons of reproduction. So we have examples of postmenopausal women bringing divorce suits against husbands who weren't having sex with them. So, wow. Yeah. Interesting court cases to read. Yeah, yeah. But we happen to know that in addition to Charity and Sylvia, who, who don't marry men, they marry each other. But we know that other women known to them opted not to marry, even some of their relatives. So why did some early American women choose not to marry? Did they just not find the loves of their life? And what kind of opportunities for work did single women have? That has been a big question and source of debate among historians, although it could be an even bigger and more debated question, in my opinion. Why do we have these really skyrocketing rates of uh, singlehood for women in the 19th century? And I think, judging from the correspondence I've read between Charity and Sylvia and their single friends, the number one reason why women in their social circle didn't marry was because of their desire to have liberty in their lives. And that was a word that I saw occur a lot in women's letters to each other. They wanted to have that same liberty um, that was such a powerful ideal of the revolutionary era and that we often understand in the context of of politics, right, or of um, uh, male concerns. Um, but for women, liberty could mean freedom from constant the constant burden of constant reproduction. And that's one thing that is so apparent from looking at how the lives of Charity and Sylvia differed from their sisters and their mothers. All of the women in both Charity's and Sylvia's families, with the exception of themselves almost, um, bore families of between 8 and 18 children. One of Sylvia's sisters-in-law bore 18 children over the course of her life. Um, So... The burden that that constant uh, childbirth and then caring for those children placed on women's time was extraordinary. Once women married, they had no time for anything but the constant labor of maintaining the household. And I see that 
for example, in a really extraordinary source, the day-to-day diary that was kept by Charity's sister-in-law, Sarah Snell Bryant. This was William Cohen Bryant's mother um, and uh, the wife of Charity's brother, Peter Bryant. And she kept a diary uh, every day of her life from 1794, which I think is the year she got married, until her death. And that diary is actually at, um, at Harvard. And you can read it, it's, it, and it's fascinating, and it just is a, a, a record of day in, day out, the labor that defined her, her life. Just, there's just constant labor. And there's, there's one point in the diary where she describes taking a moment to sketch a picture of a charity who's on a visit with Sylvia uh, to... to um, their house in Western Massachusetts. And it's this really extraordinary moment. It stands out in uh, contrast to, you know, the rest of her entries because it's like this one moment that she kind of takes for herself to do something um, that you might describe as leisure. So there's a lot of liberty that came from saying no to marriage and saying no to the burden of motherhood that came with it. And for women of the post-revolutionary generation who had increasing access to education, that liberty brought with it time to do things like read or write poetry, which was one of Charity's passions, you know, or take part in the church, take part in, in reform organizations. Um, it was hard to do those things while you were constantly uh, caring for children. There were legal benefits as well, right, to staying single for women? Absolutely. And I think that those were very important to um, uh, Charity and Sylvia. I see it particularly for Sylvia, who took the role of wife within Charity and Sylvia's marriage, but never had the uh, legal status that a traditionally married woman would have at the time, the status of being a femme covert. So because Sylvia formed her marriage with another woman rather than with a man, she was able to retain her status as a femme soul and retain uh, control over her property. Um, And that property was property that she created through her own work, right? Since she was born into this bankrupted family, she didn't inherit any property. Her father died while she was still in her teens, and her mother became um, a burden on the family. In fact, Sylvia spent a lot of resources just trying to keep up her mother who lived into her 80s. So all of um, the property that Sylvia possessed was property that she earned through constant application at the trade of sewing. She and Charity ran a tailor shop. But whereas within a conventional marriage, all of those earnings would have been the legal property of her husband, because women didn't have any control over their property within marriage, Um, Sylvia was able to keep both a sort of moral and a legal um, title to to the earnings that she uh, created through the work of her own hands. And that was very meaningful to her, which uh, is something she wrote about in her diary. Now, we've talked about how Charity went to visit her sister-in-law and how Sylvia, you know, her fam- her familial experience prompted her to want to own her own property and keep it out of a husband's hands. And it seemed throughout your book that Charity and Sylvia tried to remain close to their families. What did their families understand about their relationship? Did they know that it was a, a marriage, that they treated it as a traditional marriage? Did they accept their relationship? The family absolutely regarded the women's relationship as either a marriage or something like it. So various uh, family members wrote to them to that effect. For example, Sally Snell Bryant, the diarist, uh, wrote to the women in 1843 that I consider you both one as man and wife are one. Or her son described the relationship as being no less sacred to them than the tie of marriage. And other family members wrote similar kind of expressions of their acknowledgement of, of the fact that the women's connection was like a marriage or marital. People always couched it in you know, some degree of, of distancing because, of course, they viewed marriage between same-sex being impossible. So they had to kind of create these uh, sort of uh, – 
rhetorical expressions which both acknowledged and denied the marriage at the same time. But even, you know, considering those words um, they used to signal the difference of this marriage from conventional marriages, there was no question for any of the family that the relationship took the place in Charity and Sylvia's lives of a traditional marriage. Um, And for the most part, by the end of Charity and Sylvia's lives, the families accepted that union, in fact, even respected it and even in some cases venerated it. But getting to that point was a struggle for Charity and Sylvia, and it was the accomplishment of years of application. So initially, many members of their families rejected the women's union, and this was very painful, especially to Sylvia, because so many of her family lived in close proximity to where the women established their household in Weybridge, Vermont. Sylvia had always been very close with her mother, for example. She was the youngest of uh, child in her family, and after Sylvia's father had passed away, Sylvia and her mother were very intimate. Um, and I think the understanding in the family was that Sylvia would be responsible for caring for her mother into old age because Sylvia had made it clear at a fairly young age that she was not interested in marrying a man. And so her family kind of slotted her into the social expectation of a spinster daughter that she would take care of the aging parent. But when Sylvia went and moved in with Charity in the summer of 1807, her mother boycotted their household, were just refused to visit for about a decade. Um, and this was just devastating for Sylvia. Uh, and finally, she was able to um, win back her mother's affections and get her mother to come visit her house again. But it, it took until Charity and Sylvia had worked for about a decade and were able to accrue enough capital to expand their house. Because initially they lived together in this tiny one-room house with the bed front and center, right? It was a 12-foot by 12-foot structure, and there was no way to avoid the kind of visual evidence of the nature of Charity and Sylvia's relationship. So after they were able to build a separate bedroom and kind of separate the public and private parts of the house, then uh, Sylvia's mother came to visit. And in fact, in the later years of her life, she spent a significant amount of time boarding with Charity and Sylvia as the siblings shared responsibility for um, their mother in her old age. So it took a lot of work from Charity and Sylvia to gain the acceptance of their family. Some family members never entirely gave that acceptance. There were some of Sylvia's brothers who rarely, if ever, visited um, and made it clear that the reason why they wouldn't was because, in their words, there was no man in the house. Um, but the youngest generation... Charity and Sylvia's um, nieces and nephews, and especially their grandnieces and nephews, who were born after uh, the women's relationship had been formed and who grew up never knowing anything except this relationship, that youngest generation accepted the marriage full-heartedly and came to see it as an extremely romantic and admirable relationship. Um, and so that's what I mean by by the, by the end of their lives, some many many people in the family really venerated this bond. Um, it was so it was distinct and it was admirable and it was romantic. And when Sylvia died, her um, you know her nieces and nephews and her, her descendants were willing not only to bury her beneath the same headstone as Charity, but to spend extra money to make a really beautiful headstone for the two women. So. They changed minds over the course. So their family meets them with, you know, a mixed reception, but overall they accept them. What about their neighbors in the community of Weybridge, Vermont? I mean, did their cohabitation raise any questions among their neighbors about the nature of their relationship? I think that the cohabitation absolutely raised those questions. Those questions were inevitable for a variety of reasons. First of all, because 
people at the time did understand marriage to be a sexual institution. And when you had a relationship that was described as a marriage, it could not help but raise those questions. Um, and I have, you know, sources indicating that members of the community, just like the family, saw the relationship as a marriage. Um, for example, a young boy who grew up in the area and went to get a suit of clothes made from charity in Sylvia when um, he was in, uh, I think, his early teens, described meeting them in his memoir and said that around town, um, he always heard it mentioned as if Miss Bryant and Miss Drake were married to each other. So that was a, sort of the language that their neighbors used for for their relationship. Um, and so, yeah, they're... they're there, those questions about the sort of sexual component of that marriage were inevitable, but they, I don't think they, they were very often voiced, and they certainly weren't written down. Um, and the reasons for that is because to voice those suspicions or to especially to write those suspicions would have made the marriage untenable. Um, but it was it was very possible for Charity and Sylvia to live in a situation that I describe as sort of an open secret. So they they were not in the closet in the way that we often understand that term to mean like some some secret knowledge unknown to everybody else. The closet for them was this kind of open secret where people knew about it but refrained from saying anything because Charity and Sylvia contributed so much to their community. They played an extremely important part in their local church, uh, both contributing money to it, helping to keep it up, maintaining long correspondences with um, the various ministers who pass through town, teaching Sunday school. They played a vital part in the local economy. They had this Charity in particular had this very important skill she gave to the town because she was a trained tailor and knew how to cut clothes, which was um, rare for the time. Uh, They also brought cash into the economy. They hired women to to work for them as their apprentices. They trained young women in their trade. They contributed money to their nieces and nephews to uh, go to school. Um, They bought them gifts. They had a huge amount of medical knowledge. Charity's father had been a doctor, and her brother was a doctor, and her grandfather was a doctor. And the women shared their medical knowledge with the community. So they played such an important and vital role in the community that that I think the consensus was that, well, we just won't talk about those things which we can't talk about. It was an agreed-upon silence. And I think that that was probably very common for the ways in which rural communities in early America dealt with all sorts of moral transgressors. It was not possible to, um, you know, drive away everybody who broke the rules because so many people broke the rules and everybody was, you know, people who made positive contributions to their society were needed. Would it have been possible for two men to live together as Sylvia and Charity did in early America? I do think it's possible, and I do think there are examples of it in the sources. I think it was harder for a variety of reasons. Um, first of all, when uh, when two women formed a relationship together, and as in Charity and Sylvia's relationship, one of those women uh, took on the position of the husband, sort of, um, you know, taking on male prerogatives like um, dealing in the public sphere and go, you know, going to market, being the public face of that relationship, that sort of aspiration to um, a more masculine social role was understandable to people at the time. And it naturalized male privilege in a weird way, because of course, who, who wouldn't want access to that privilege? For a man to take on the role of um, a wife, on the other hand, was a lot uh, a lot more troublesome, I think, to men at the time because it really denaturalized male privilege. It was harder to justify and explain away a man who would give up um, the the privileges of of masculinity. So I think that there are ways in which um, you, same-sex relationships between men, especially where one of the men took on a female gendered role were more troubling 
really, than relationships between women. In addition, I think it was probably harder for people to um, silence their knowledge about the sexual aspects of relationships between men than relationships between women, especially by the mid-19th century when, um, you know, ideas about sex are changing and women are increasingly uh, is seen within this kind of context of passionlessness. It's easier to kind of ignore women as as sexual by the mid-19th century, but it's very hard to do that for men in the mid-19th century. Um, so I think that made relationships between men more challenging um, to secure public acceptance, but not impossible. And we do have examples of male same-sex couples. And I, one thing that comes to mind is um, a very famous story of a bachelor marriage between two 49ers um, in California, you know, following the gold rush, uh, a relationship made famous by Bret Hart in um, his story, Tennessee's Partner. And it's slightly later, obviously. But I think that um, this famous relationship, which lasted for decades and again received kind of a similar sort of um, admiration that Charity and Sylvia's did suggests that there were possibilities for for men um, to live together uh, as same sex couples prior to you know the modern age, um, and I I hope that there's more research going on out there to recover those stories for us. Well, this is pretty remarkable story, um, especially since it shows that even though Americans lived. 200, you know, to 150 years ago, their society in some ways looks a fair amount like our present day society. And maybe that's because, you know, we want to see it that way. But it seems like the sources really indicate that it, you know, it's more similar than different in some aspects, or at least in the aspect of marriage. Yeah, well, similar and different, right? Continuities and disjunctures. Uh, The Biggest disjuncture being, you know, to get back to an earlier question of yours, the, the, in the nature and the ways in which marriage has become redefined, you know, as a legal institution. So obviously, marriage was a very significant legal institution in early America, and and that was critical for managing the transmission of property, and you know, which is one of the key things that marriage does. <laughs> um, but the, you know, in the um, in the 18th century and in the 19th century, there were many common law marriages that were not enacted by necessarily through civil license or even through um, a legal officiant, but marriages that were just established by two people who lived together um, and who were known within their community as husband and wife. This is why when you asked if Charity and Sylvia's relationship was a legal marriage, I said, well, it's a little bit gray because actually the boundary between, you know, legal marriage and and and, and not legal marriage or between legal marriage and, and just uh, cohabitation was a little bit fuzzy um, throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. And I think that really changes in the uh, 20th century uh, with the expansion of the state and, you know, and the creation of, you know, the increasing numbers of ways in which your status, your specific legal status as married or not married affects your interactions uh, with government at both the local and the, the federal level. And that, of course, it's that context which makes the battle over same-sex marriage in the 21st century so important. That we now have a state in which, you know, there's over 1,000 different federal regulations that uh, um, depend on the marital status of an individual, right? So you can't have this kind of fuzzy line anymore. <laughs> it's vitally important that um, people establish legal marriages. Um, so, so marriage continues to change. I think we have continuities. This is not the first time. Um, in American history when uh, same-sex couples have managed to establish marriages, but the meaning of those marriages are changing. And and I think, and I hope, in fact, that um, marriage will continue to change in the future as a consequence of the legalization of same-sex marriage. Maybe we'll have further redefining of roles like husband and wife or what it means to be a spouse and how to maintain one's, you know, 
individual identity within the marital union and all the rest. Well, it's hard to believe, but it is already time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Are you ready for the time warp, Rachel? I am ready for the time warp. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. All right. So here's your question. In your opinion, what might have happened if Sylvia and Charity had not moved to the small frontier community of Weybridge, Vermont? Would these women have been able to set up their household in a more established or urban community? Such a great question because it totally flips so many of our ideas about where uh, is where have gay lives been possible or where has gay community been possible. I think we have such a modern bias towards imagining the city as the space where it's possible for people to live um, lives defined by same-sex intimacies. But I think in early America, that's not necessarily the case, and that the the frontier, in fact, held a lot of possibility for people to craft original or transgressive lives. Um, So, Weybridge was a Goldilocks place, absolutely, for Charity and Sylvia. um, There were all of these elements that made it just right for Charity and Sylvia to set up their household. For example, there was a a woman landowner whom they were able to acquire some land from, which was very rare at the time. In fact, she was the only one in Weybridge, and she only acquired the land immediately before Charity and Sylvia moved on to it. But... It was, you know, just a kind of perfect circumstance that allowed them to to, to build a home somewhere but not be under suspicion of, you know, being mistresses of the male landowner or something. Or they were just far enough from Charity's family that they – that her family wasn't able to break up the union and the town was just new enough that the – positive qualities that Charity brought to it were vital enough, essential enough to, again, keep anybody from breaking up the household. So Weybridge is this kind of like Goldilocks place for uh, Charity and Sylvia as a couple, but I don't think it was the only place like that. I think that there were other frontier communities which could have or might have worked. And I'm reminded of another couple we know of, another same-sex female couple who lived contemporaneously with Charity and Sylvia, and that's um, Marianne Wilson and Miss Brundage, and we've lost her first name. We just don't know. But this was a, a female couple who lived in Greene County, New York, which was another frontier county uh, in the early 19th century, first decade of the 19th century. And we have very few sources about them, so we can't know as much about them as we know about Charity and Sylvia. But from what we know, they lived in a romantic and original uh, household uh, on the New York state frontier. Um, and Mary Ann Wilson was a painter um, and painted some like really fabulous and wonderful original uh, American folk art, which I think is uh, I think it's in Washington mostly and some in Boston, I think. Um, and uh, Miss Brundage operated the farm. So I think there were other frontier communities with you sort of, you know, with same-sex couples, same-sex households. Could Charity and Sylvia have made it work there? I don't know. But And the city was not itself entirely inhospitable to same-sex couples either. So I'm reminded of um, a couple same-sex female households described um, in Karen Wolf's book, Not All Wives, you know, a couple of Quaker women who ran a school together in Philadelphia in the mid-18th century, or a couple of women whom Claire Lyons mentions in her work, whose uh, household got busted up for cohabitation, again, in Philadelphia in the late 18th century. So maybe they could have found their way in the city. Yeah, it sounds like it was possible. So before we conclude, would you tell us about your latest historical research project? I would be happy to. 
So I'm working on a project now called The Not So Innocents Abroad, and it's a queer history of food and sex and the lives of Anglophone expatriates in France and Italy from the late 18th through the mid 20th centuries. So it's a, it's a new a new field for me, um, stepping into the history of food, which I haven't done before, but I'm having a great time. And uh, I, I like to joke that this book is going to be the third in a trilogy, really, that covers a cultural history of the basic life functions. You know, I wrote a first book about death, a second book about sex, and now I finally get on to, to food and eating, um, which is great because I get to I get to read a lot of recipes and cook a lot of recipes, too. I'm having a lot of fun. Basically, the book is about what is the connection between Parmesan cheese and perversity. And so if you're interested in finding out the answer to that question, I blog about it um, at rachelhopecleaves.com. So we shall see. And your blog is very interesting read, and it often makes me hungry. Like that time you cooked uh, Ben Franklin's apple tart. Um, Yes. And um, I'm going to have an upcoming blog post where I follow in the baking the baking path of Emily Dickinson, okay. well-known hermit, less well-known baker, which apparently was a fabulous baker. Well, we'll have a link in the show notes to your blog so people can catch up with that post. Now, speaking of your blog, where else should people look for more information about you, your work, and how to get in contact with you? Well, I welcome people getting in contact with me. You can reach me at my email, which is rcleaves at uh, uvic.ca, uvic.ca. And as you mentioned, I'm on Twitter, so uh, which I think is at Rachel Cleaves. Um, so, yeah, on my blog, on Twitter, by email, I welcome all communications. And we will make it easy for people to communicate with you because we'll have those links on the show notes page for this episode. Well, Rachel, we really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you very much for sharing your historical insights with us here on Ben Franklin's World. And thank you so much for having me. I, I've been enjoying listening to the podcasts and finding out about all these great books I want to read. It's fabulous. Charity and Sylvia's Marriage shows us that same-sex marriage is not a new issue or occurrence in the history of the United States. The community of Weybridge, Vermont, accepted Charity and Sylvia and supported their marriage by not asking questions about the intimate lives of these women. And they didn't ask these questions because these women were active participants in the community. They positively impacted Weybridge by working to make the lives of their friends, family members, and neighbors better. And that's all the community wanted and cared about. The story of Charity and Sylvia also shows us how limited opportunities were for early American women. If either of these women had married a man, she would have likely given birth to many children and any property or money she acquired through her hard work or inheritance would legally have belonged to her husband. You can find information about Rachel, her book, Charity and Sylvia, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode, which you'll find at benfranklinsworld.com slash 013. And finally, if you haven't done so already, would you please rate this podcast? Your rating and review will help keep Ben Franklin's World visible and findable for new people. To rate and review Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history, just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash iTunes or benfranklinsworld.com slash Stitcher. And if you have already rated and reviewed this podcast, like L. Mosier, Hist GKK, Matt Wick Williams, Thruway J, Spencer M, or G. Wisner, Another way you could help others find Ben Franklin's world is by telling your friends and family members about us. And just as a reminder, if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for this show, please tweet me at Liz Covart or send me an email to liz at benfranklinsworld.com. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.